Well, the world has changed so much in the past 50 years. People and institutions are more connected. The rate of change and innovation is increasing, and the United States of America needs to play a different role in the world than it did under the Cold War. Yet, our educational system hasn't exactly caught up, or is kept up, and it you know, was really created for the old world. In order for this generation to solve today's global challenges, they need to know more than quadratic equations or to have read Upton Sinclair. And they particularly need more than a high score on a standardized test. Fundamentally, in this world of constant change, they need to know when and how to apply these skills. That means critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, and communication dexterity. Skills that will allow them to tackle, tackle the challenges that uh, have yet to be identified. And they need to understand the world, how it interacts, and how their decisions have an impact, not only in their own community, but on people's lives halfway across the world. We adults haven't quite figured out how to accomplish this. Throughout the past 50 years, our public education system has been largely designed by grown-ups who have forgotten what it's like to learn, which perhaps has resulted in the ineffective approach that we have today. We've leaned so hard on the mass production of education. We failed to adapt how children, our, our systems to how children actually learn. These last 50 years of educational reform have ignored the fundamental psychological and neurological discoveries made by physicians and scientists, psychologists and educators. And instead, we've just trudged along with this standardization as an attempt to fix all ills. So I contend we need some radicalism. And to do this, we need to adopt, uh, uh, we need to adopt the lens of a group of people who are obsessed with learning who have a vested interest in making education work, and who have a natural curiosity for exploring new ideas. They'll have the ability to tell us what does actually work in education. So you may be wondering, who is this uniquely qualified uh, group of individuals? It's quite simple, actually. Five-year-olds. So I asked myself, what would school look like if we designed it through the eyes of a child learning for the very first time? What if a five-year-old was the CEO of Chicago Public Schools? After perusing through my old child development textbooks and thinking about the five-year-olds that I know, like Jack and like Sophia, it became clear how a five-year-old would design and run Chicago Public Schools and how they would build a school around four fundamental components, their emotional, physical, cognitive, and social development. So let's start with emotional development. How many of you have been on a road trip with a five-year-old? All right, we've got, we've got some. Um, so as you know, five-year-olds are yammers. They love to talk. Sophia and, uh, and, and Jack, um, they crave guidance and feedback from their parents. Um, and given this need for parental reinforcement, a five-year-old would likely create a school where their parents could really be part of their learning and part of their daily discoveries perhaps where their dad could learn alongside them by attending classes, or their mom could be part of their day-to-day -day lessons by extending school into their home. And when it comes to physical development, let's be honest, five-year-olds love to move. A jack is wiggly and adventurous, and play is a very critical component um, of this developmental stage, as children are learning so much about the world um, through their interactions with peers. And so a five-year-old would likely create a school where they could run and jump and swing and chase and where all this physical movement and activity could be integral part of the school day. Um, where they eat delicious food that powers their brains and where math and science and literacy and geography could be part of learning through experiential hands-on lessons. And what about cognitive development? Five-year-olds are learning machines. Sophia's world is full of magic. They've got living objects and new ideas waiting to be organized. They seek active hands-on opportunities to test new ideas and concepts. And they constantly challenge their existing world, often developing these elaborate stories for how the world is or for how the world ought to be. 
And socially, a five-year-old's imaginary play and self-talk both suggest they are watching and learning a great deal about social interactions in terms of their relationship to them. And as they mature, they develop more perspective about how they fit into their family, how they fit into their community, and how they fit into the world. They care about bugs, and they are fascinated by trees. And Jack has empathy uh, for living things, from his pet gerbil to the worm at the park uh, to his baby sister. So given the psychological profile of a five-year-old, what do you think would happen if Sophia took over our educational system tomorrow? Fortunately, we don't have to wonder. You see, eight years ago, I decided to take a new approach to this educational predicament of ours, and I rode a bike and a camel and a bus and a boat and a rickshaw in about 80 countries in my early 20s examining these international models of education. And when I was 23, I rode that same bike down to the Board of Education with an idea, an idea to build an entirely new public school in one of the most underserved parts of Chicago, a school that was inspired by five-year-olds. Understandably, the chief academic officer at Chicago Public Schools thought I was completely crazy. The school, though, would do four things, I explained, based on what we know um, and how we know students most effectively learn. They would engage, the school would engage parents uh, to, to cater to the students' emotional needs, whole student education to address the physical needs and curiosity of children, focus on academic rigor to satisfy their cognitive needs, and focus on international mindedness to complement their increasing interest in the world around them. So I went to the Board of Education three times over the course of three years, and I promised that students in this school would not only outperform students on standardized tests, but that this school would be a model for these new skills that would help children succeed in the world. It was time to reimagine education, I explained. However, for two years, the Board of Education said, listen, Nine out of 10 of those children that you're looking to serve, they're already failing by the time they enter kindergarten. And over 80% of those children, they live below the poverty line. And their parents, they have other things to worry about. They're not going to care. They suggested that I scale back the mission and focus solely on academics. Something less sophisticated is what they said for those children. But the third year, they hesitantly agreed, and the Academy for Global Citizenship was born as a Chicago public school. So fast forward four short years to today, and let's visit our school. I was there this morning, and as I walk past the cracked asphalt parking lot, you can see of our old barrel factory is where our classrooms are currently housed. Um, you'll walk past a wind turbine and a solar energy learning lab and a chicken coop and a garden, and you'll walk into our doors where our walls hum with excitement. And this is what you'll see. Children are soaking up parent involvement. We've got parents volunteering at least 20 hours a year, including Sophia's grandfather, pouring milk at breakfast, building beds for our organic raised bed schoolyard garden, attending roundtable meetings and parent education events. In fact, we've got 98% of our parents showing up for parent-teacher conferences. Children are being nurtured, both their, mo their bodies and their minds. We've got students eating an organic breakfast and lunch, being prepared in a zero-waste cafeteria with daily physical education. And there's an award hanging on the wall uh, from the White House recognizing our leadership in health and wellness. And children are also getting their cognitive fill. Uh, we've shifted that statistic, and we now have 80% of our students uh, meeting or exceeding literacy standards. But what's more, we've got 93% of our third and fourth grade students meeting or exceeding math standards. And children are growing to understand their power and their role as global citizens. We have 100% Sophia and Jack and 100% of their friends are learning a second or a third language. Students are organizing food pantries, saving the endangered species campaigns, and teaching us all a thing or two about 
recycling. So at the Academy for Global Citizenship, we encourage our students to make both decisions and mistakes in the garden and with inventions to show them that the power they have to be agents of change. We ask our students what they want from their learning environment, empowering them to think for themselves as learners and as innovators. And we listen to the things that they can't yet quite articulate, like when a child has an eagerness for movement, rather than forcing them to sit still in a rigid desk, Sophia's teacher bought her uh, an exercise ball to replace her chair. So I've got to say, not a day passes that I don't recall those words of the adults that did not believe that these children could learn, that it was too late, that we should scale back this mission and just focus on the three R's. And whenever I, whenever I speak, I'm asked about what help I need. I often receive these requests to create another school. But I'm here today to tell the world, no, I don't want to create another school because that's not the solution. You see, in order to impact the 405,000 public school students in the city of Chicago, or the 81.5 million children learning in public schools across this nation, we must focus on systemic change. What we've built is proof that thinking differently about a system of education that hasn't materially progressed over the last 50 years can yield disproportionately positive results in, in academic, interpersonal, physical, and in, in, in the global strength of a population. We don't spend more money than other Chicago public schools, yet we see vastly better outcomes across multiple measures. And there are other schools and other models of education achieving the same results across the nation through innovation. So we're building a laboratory to focus on evaluating, extracting, refining, and scaling education intervention in, in innovations to build for, from both our school, rather, and schools from across the nation. In essence, we want to learn a thing or two about the technological innovators of our time and open source what works in education, ranging from these sustainable building technologies to these innovative teaching technologies. But we need your help. So I've got a homework assignment for you based on your five-year-old inner wisdom. First, as you return to your office next week, I challenge you to question the assumptions of your adult perspective. Approach your day through the lens of a five-year-old's curiosity. Embrace wonder. And imagine experiencing the world for the very first time. Second, I invite you to come and witness what reimagining education can look like and what happens when we think differently about what is possible. Next time you find yourself stuck in a challenge, get up and move, do a few jumping jacks, and consider how this physical activity impacts your cognition. And then imagine what that's like for a child when movement is integrated into learning. Third, leave, live each and every day with a five-year-old's concern and fascination for the world. Consider the impact that we have on our global community and commit to making one small change for making the world a healthier place for Jack, for Sophia, for your grandchildren and children, and for the nearly half million children that were born today across the world. And fourth and last, consider this. Five-year-olds are masters for understanding the need for other people around us. The only way that we're going to solve this seemingly intractable challenge of reforming education is contributing our collective capacities. So I invite you to sit down with me to figure out how you can get involved in the creation of this laboratory of innovation in education. We need everybody. We're looking for scientists, educators, communicators, philanthropists, physicians, technologists, and entrepreneurs, you name it, to really construct this movement that's going to take these labs innovations and scale them to create fundamental change across the United States of America and beyond. And that's what I mean by scale. 
it's creating this simple systemic mindset shift that can spread. This is not about the next generation. This is about Sophia and the 81.5 million children sitting in classrooms across America right now. This is about the five-year-olds who, who are going to be leading this world sooner than we can ever imagine. We can't stop the world from changing. We can only adapt with it. By embracing the wisdom of one of the world's greatest assets, the wonder and limitless potential of the world through a five-year-old's eyes. Thank you. Thank you.